Welcome to the CEO Insider Podcast brought to you by Y Texas. My name is Sandy McQuarrie. In this episode, we'll talk to the CEO of U.S. Concrete, Bill Sandbrook. We'll talk to Bill about the challenges involved in building the 1 million square foot headquarters of Toyota. Also, why Bill checks the weather first thing every morning and how autonomous cars could be a major disruptor for the good in the concrete business. Enjoy this episode of the CEO Insider Podcast with the CEO of U.S. Concrete, Mr. Bill Sandbrook. Bill, I know that you're uh, you're from the East Coast, graduated from West Point. How did you end up in Texas? Well, I actually ended up in Texas in third grade, believe it or not, in Waco. And I went oh. to third, fourth, and fifth grade in Waco. My father was in the cement industry, and he was on the operations side of cement manufacturing. And there's a really nice cement plant in Waco that we were transferred to. And we had <laughs> we had moved here from Connecticut. So it was a big transition, more a big transition for my parents moving from Connecticut to Texas right. than it was for a kid of, you know, third grade. You're thinking about John Wayne and Cowboys and Indians. It was a great adventure being at Waco in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then uh, in my adult career, I took – when I – took over the uh, role of CEO of U.S. Concrete. I was working for another company, CRH, Cement Road Hold- Roadstone Holdings in Atlanta, and actually moved to Houston for a year because U.S. Concrete was headquartered in Houston. And in 2012, for various reasons, I moved the headquarters to the Metroplex where we ended up uh, right in the middle next to DFW in a, a small suburb called Euless, Texas. You said a nice concrete facility. What makes it a nice one? Well, <laughs> uh, lar- large volume, mm-hmm. uh, great stewardship of the environment, not too many neighbors, uh, a good workforce. And I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, it's a Texas-centric program, and uh, I'm a Texas-centric guy now. But there's no better place to do business in the concrete business or cement business in the country right now than in Texas. Right. I was going to ask you, what was your motivation to move from Houston to Euless? What was it that, that made you want to do that? Was it location being more central? Well, yes, partly. We The company was founded in the late 1990s in Houston. So the first CEO and really the founding financial wherewithal came out of out of Houston. But we had no operations in Houston. So we had a headquarters of about 60 or 70 people. And our closest manufacturing facility was in the Dallas Metroplex about 200 miles away. So mm-hmm. I didn't think uh, I, I I did not think that was an optimum way for to to build uh, the culture that I wanted where there was a headquarters servicing the field and I wanted the headquarters to be much more uh, aligned where where we made the money. Mm-hmm. So we co-located with an operation I had here in in the Metroplex. So I co-located our national headquarters with our regional headquarters, and we actually share the same building now. So my my, uh, corporate staff at the national level are much more connected to the business here in Dallas than they were in Houston. Taking a look around the state with Texas booming, um, construction everywhere, I'm going to go ahead and guess that business is pretty good. Business is really good in Texas. What we need is better weather. Oh, are you saying because of the wet weather that we've had or the cold? Absolutely. Or the, yeah. No, the, the uh, 2018 being an awful wet year, record record rainfall in, in many parts of the state. In Dallas, we had records in March. We had records in September. We had records in October. And in, in Texas, we have a lot of low-rise construction as opposed to high-rise construction. But we have some in the metropolitan areas. We have a, a large rural footprint in Texas as well. And in a metroplex, for instance, we have a lot of slab work for warehouses and data centers. So when it rains, you, you don't necessarily have access to that job site for a number of days. So you not, not only lose the day of the bad weather, but then a couple days after that you can't produce any uh, concrete. I know all about uh, working with concrete in the rain. When I was in college, uh, I worked construction for a company in Omaha, Nebraska called Hawkins Construction. And I willed concrete all summer long for four years. <laughs> and that is very humbling, hard work. And when the, when it doesn't, when it rains and you don't, you don't get paid. 
So I did. I always I checked the weather forecast every single day when I was a kid. I still do today. And so I'm guessing that you first thing you do is look at the weather every morning. I look at the weather every morning, but we have a lot of business outside of Texas. But I want to go back to something you just said that when it rained, you didn't get paid. Mm-hmm. What's happened now in Texas, and it's it's localized to Texas, is that there's such a shortage of ready mix truck drivers, and 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 a competitive marketplace with all of our uh, competitors for those limited number of drivers that we've all that we've gone to a guaranteed 40 hour paid work week whether it rains snows or whether they work or not on a 52 week basis so unfortunately for the profitability of the company it 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 stresses us to some extent when your variable labor becomes fixed mm-hmm. and then you're really dependent on good weather and we have to, you know, we have to, us and our competitors have to pass that that shortage of labor cost increase through to the customers with increased prices, which always isn't understood on their on their part. That well, that that is stressful. I mean, you're paying people whether they're if they're not working. That that's stressful. It's <laughs> it's stressful. <laughs> I mean, but, no... but you know, when when I put on another hat, when if the weather is this bad in Texas. And as it has been in the past in the past year, and a, a person can't depend on his paycheck, uh, you know, from from week to week, from month to month, it's it's a very stressful part on, on on their behalf as well. So I understand I understand the need. And then when certain competitors add that as a benefit, you have to keep up, or you just end up losing drivers. You guys um, helped build the uh, headquarters for Toyota. That was over a million square feet. Am I correct? Correct. That was a really nice job for us, and uh, and just you know one of many headquarter relocations that are going on in the Metroplex that we participated in. And can you tell us a little bit more about that project from Genesis to to finished? Uh, how that overall? How would you say that project went? Was it a smooth job? Was it tough? Was it have its struggles that, that you expected, or or more? I would say it had its struggles at the beginning, as any large job does, as the, the contractor gets used to you and you get used to the service needs of, of the job. Uh, we ended up treating that, obviously, with kids' glove because it was so large, put a project manager on the job because it warranted it. But even leading up to the time that we were awarded that job, we brought in our, our California team. We have a large business in California and New York, but our California team uh, just because the way the I would say the culture is, it's much more environmentally sensitive in California. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a much greener environment, uh, and I, I would say it's much more in the forefront of all business decisions. So we've developed special techniques and special products to minimize the carbon footprint of our products. And that sales team and that management team in California is more tuned into that type of selling uh, attribute than, say, a normal Texas project manager or manager uh, with my company would be. So we married up the two teams on our approach to Toyota uh, when we were selling ourselves as the preferred concrete supplier. So it gave us, I think, a, a leg up on the other competitors within our local uh, local market here that we could add uh, something that maybe the the more Texas centric concrete customer or concrete companies couldn't. So it was a very unique, you know, merging of our national capabilities to to win that project. Bill, can you give us an idea? You talk about your carbon footprint uh, when pouring concrete, working with concrete. What was going on? If there's one simple example you could use for a guy like me or anyone else listening doesn't know a whole lot about concrete. Can you tell us what was in concrete or going on 30 years ago that's different now? Well, there, there's a lot of things that are different. One of the primary uh, one of the primary attributes is to lower carbon footprint of concrete, what you need to do is reduce the cement content mm-hmm. because cement manufacturing, that's the powder that goes into concrete. The, the process is very energy intensive. So you have to burn a lot of energy in order to to get the the rock hot enough to tr- chemically transform into a cementitious material, i.e., the ingredient that makes concrete hard. And because 
the the energy needed to produce cement is so large, by definition, if you can lower the amount of cement and still have the same strengths in your finished concrete product, you would reduce the carbon footprint. So the use of what's called a pozzolan, that's the technical term for the uh, the property that, or the, the constituent that makes concrete hard. If you can get a cement substitute that that is uh, less energy intensive to produce to lower the overall carbon footprint of that entire supply chain. So fly ash, for instance, is used as a substitute for cement. There's other pozzolans that are used, and as well as chemicals now, to be able to to lower the uh, carbon footprint or to make the, the make the concrete harder, to to make it so it dries faster, so you don't have as many trips, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of nuanced ways, but but the, by and large, you want to make the the concrete have the same physical attributes with less cement in it, and we're capable of doing that. Bill, have you ever been to Rome? I have been to Rome, yes. Or are you, isn't it amazing to think that that they invented concrete so many so so long ago and used it so efficiently? It's uh, it it's pretty incredible. <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely incredible. So the, going back to the Toyota project, that was that ended up being bigger than you guys had originally anticipated. Correct? Uh, yes, it did. But you know, a lot of projects do that. There's add-ons to the project. The design is still under review. The campus continues to build out. That's not unusual. It's not. Okay. I was just wondering, you know, um, I realize that your business is nationwide. You mentioned your, your Cal, your, your, the California group. Is there anything specific about being headquartered in Texas that's been helpful to the success of U.S. concrete? Is there something you could point to that say, yeah, we could probably only do that in Texas? Well, um, that's a that's a difficult question. I, I I like having our headquarters located here because we we get very very skilled white collar workers at an affordable rate. The cost of living is less here to be to be uh, headquartered in Texas. I think the work environment, the work ethic, is uh, beyond reproach and and probably better than than most of the country. It's very convenient for my management team to manage a, a national operation where a lot of us have to travel a significant amount that if we were headquartered in New York, for instance, I'd have to travel coast to coast to get to my West Coast operations. Bringing people to the center, you only have, have, to, have to go half the distance. Um, I, I would say that the tax structure in Texas for our employees, it's, it's fantastic. I think our workers' compensation and medical costs are lower for not only my headquarters people, but for all my operations in Texas. I mean, Texas is a great state to do business in. Not that the others are not good and they all have their own attributes. Texas is one of the most business-friendly states there is that, that we operate in. You know, Bill, every, every CEO that comes onto, this, onto the CEO Insider podcast is facing disruption in their industry. It seems like every 25 to 35 year old out there is some form of disruptor <laughs> and right. you know it, it is the way that it is there's people out there that are trying to change things are you seeing much of that in your business in particular uh what comes to mind for me is 3d printing um are that any other technologies that, that are that are disrupting your business and what are you well, doing I, about it yeah i think 3d printing's a, a little ways away yet from whole scale displacement of concrete and housing. I know they're doing units now. You know, you, you can do some some lower end houses, maybe for, I would say, hurricane relief or something that mm -hmm. you can put together quickly through 3D houses, but it's not a major market for us. Maybe by 2050 or 2060, it'll be so sophisticated that that is a major disruptor. I'm not, it, it, that's pretty far down the road. I do think what's closer, I, I think autonomous vehicles or or technology assisted vehicles are going to be disruptive. One to labor force on long haul concrete supply. Two, it's going to be very beneficial if if uh, there's more automation 
that you can actually get a truck to a job site and then control the the chute because you you remember you had the wheelbarrow concrete <laughs> at one point yeah. if you could if you could control the chute into the wheelbarrow or control the control the chute into the pump remotely there's less risk of accidents i mm -hmm. think all of the technology that you see in your own cars right now that are preventing accidents through taking over your braking, taking over your, your lane changing. I think that's a tremendous disruptor for the good on, on less accidents in our industry. Uh, so I, I think those are the primary ones. So driverless and autonomous vehicles, 3D printing's kind of out, out in the road a little bit. What, okay. you know, in some of, there is a new one kind of been kicking around now for the last couple of years, is, is tall wood structured skyscrapers that the wood industry now is creeping into codes and standards and getting higher and higher, uh, I'd say taller and taller buildings made out of wood. That's a major disruptor for concrete because they're disrupt, they're displacing concrete and steel. So that is a battle that's currently waging now between our product categories. Uh, Bill, you guys are, are a leading indicator when it comes to the economy and some people are talking about a potential recession uh, late next year. Uh, how do you see that playing out? Well, you know, there's all kinds of talk about there. There's been talk about this. I've had the question of where are we in the cycle since about 2015, mm -hmm. and now we're at 2019. We have a pretty good line of sight because we work off a, a backlog. Our, you know, our projects are bid, and they're, they don't go the next day. It's not like calling up and I deliver something the next day. In fact, <laughs> our schedule's you know, in, in the main time of the, of the season, in the main production times of our of our season, you have to you have to book your concrete one or two weeks ahead to get a slot. And in, that would be in Dallas, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're, you know, I think I don't see any sign of a slowdown in our major markets in 2019. Uh, when, as we get out to 2020, 2021, I think it's going to be dependent on the ultimate outcome of how the the uh, tax reduction plays out in increased spending and consumer confidence. I think it it depends on the rate of increase of the of the federal funds rate, and there's been some uh, attenuation there, so that slowed down a little bit. I think that extends the cycle, and the biggest one for our industry, for heavy materials and construction, road construction would be a federal infrastructure bill. If there would be a federal infrastructure bill of a meaningful you know, $1 trillion, which has been kicked around for a number of years, well, since since the this administration had taken over, uh, I think that would definitely extend the cycle as it relates to building products and, and road builders, and I think that would be a good shot in the arm for us. Now, for our own business, we're only 18% exposed, 18% of our revenues come from infrastructure-related projects, but even that 18% would be meaningful late in the cycle. Gotcha. Gotcha. You've been involved with Y Texas for a few years now. And, uh, yeah. but what, yes, I have. yeah, Y Texas, when we decided to get involved at the state level with workforce development, you were the first CEO to raise your hand and help lead that effort. Can you tell us why it means so much to you, uh, professionally and personally? Well, let, let's start on, on professionally. As I said earlier in the, our discussion, it's very difficult getting ready-mix truck drivers. And the traditional paths of huh, the old ones of putting it out in the newspaper are long gone. <laughs> the old one, And then the, the fairly old ones of just posting an ad on Monster or something, that's right. in the rearview mirror now. N none of those things are working, partly because we're at, almost at full employment. And, uh, and additionally, because younger people aren't gravitating – gravitating to trades it's not just truck drivers but it's any it'd be roofers it'd be electricians it's plumbers anybody that needs school skilled workers the uh, the, the traditional vote technical education that was around when i was in high school you know 40 years ago just isn't an attractive approach everybody wants to be a website designer right, or right. The internet or they want to be a disruptor and you know this, this is not an easy job it's a it's a fulfilling and a, a and a, a well-paying job, but it's not one that kids gravitate to. So, you know, those type of challenges. And then the other challenges of just getting young people into, into construction or into a brick and mortar industry, you know, in, 
outside of the trades, even into the white collar work. You know, guys want to go on and be a hedge fund manager. They want to be an right. investment banker. You know, they don't want to come out and be a, you know, a financial analyst in a concrete company. You know, there's no fun in that. Little <laughs> do they know that, you know, if you can find your passion in these type of out of favor businesses, you can have a wonderful career. And if you're, if you're sharp and a go-getter, you can far, you can advance much more quickly here than if you go to Wall Street or San Francisco. And this seems to what you just said seems to really play into the offer that you made to the Dallas Community College District that would help them train and prepare people ready to take jobs with you. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to invest in those local community colleges or local, uh, you know, trade trade schools with resources, with with people to help train, with ready mix trucks that they can they can drive and practice on. We're like I said, the days of a newspaper ad, a radio mm -hmm. ad, or a monster ad are long gone. We have to be very much more proactive in this now. You said something earlier. We, were, we talked about how that you know working for a concrete company is not real attractive. People don't gravitate toward that. People, young people, are not learning a trade. And I remember during the presidential election, Marco Rubio said something that stuck with me. He said, uh, "We need uh, less philosophers and more plumbers." <laughs> 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 and I can add, I can add ten other job categories to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's it's interesting. You know, I'm 50 years old, but when I was a kid, that was a good job working for a concrete company. It really sure. was. I mean, me and my buddies, like you had to have a friend that had a friend or a dad or someone that could get you on to get a job with that. I can remember that same way in quarries because they were high paying jobs. You got to work outside. You were young, you know, yeah. and it was embraced. But when you look at the entire, you know, the, the next generations, you don't, you just don't see the kids out playing ball anymore, or, or doing the things that we did when, when I was growing up, at least in Waco, Texas, in third grade. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember being at that age. All I wanted was a good car, and I knew if I worked my butt off all summer long, I might have enough money to at least have the down payment for the car. It's it's I, really weird. I, 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 I remember. I yeah, remember. it's it's really really strange. Uh, let's talk. I'm a big uh, Formula One fan. Um, you know, we have. I'm here in Austin, Texas. We host the U.S. Grand Prix every year. You have an interesting relationship with one of the greatest drivers of all time, with Mario Andretti. Well, and we're we're involved in the uh, IndyCar series, uh -huh. and we are sponsoring Mario's grandson, Marco Andretti, in nine races, and we have the primary sponsorship of the Austin Indy race this spring as well. Uh, I'm going to be there drive, for that. Are you going to be here? I'll be there for sure. I'm and uh, he drives the U.S. concrete car, and we use it as a great venue to bring our our most valuable customers to an inside look at IndyCar racing with, mm -hmm. with tremendous amount of exposure over two to three days with the Andrettis and the Andretti family and the, and the back scenes of IndyCar racing in the garage with the mechanics, with the driver, with the driver's crew chief, uh, and the Andretti's themselves. And it's, we, we bring people from our local operations in Texas to Texas Motor Speedway. We'll do it in Austin. We did it in Long Beach, California, in Sonoma, California, for our California operations. We do it at the Pocono 500 for our East Coast operations. And it's a tremendous experience that we offer to our most valuable customers. Boy, I'd love to see that uh, the grid here in Austin at the Circuit of the Americas. Let's have a ready mix concrete truck race. Let's get about well, ten of them, that, ten of them out there. <laughs> we had a ready mix truck parade at yeah. Texas Motor Speedway, where we had thirty-one trucks in driving on the apron. They couldn't drive on the track because people don't realize how steeply banked those yeah. ovals, those tri ovals are. But yeah. we had thirty-one ready mix trucks with an American flag and a Texan flag circle the uh, entire racetrack and it was quite a sight to see oh that's awesome that is very cool well maybe we'll bump into each other when you're down here for the indie race i would love That'd to, great, Sandy. I, to I meet you to and i uh, i really appreciate uh, your time with us here on the ceo insider podcast and uh, best of luck and hopefully you'll have some dry days and get a lot of work done <laughs> all right that's what i'm hoping for too thanks sandy all right buddy take care bye -bye. okay all right bye-bye